Thanks everyone for, uh, for coming to see my talk. My name is Mark Studley. I work at IBM. I have worked at IBM since uh, far too long ago. 2002 now, I guess it is. Um, I build just-in-time compilers and ahead-of-time compilers for Java. So I've worked on the IBM SDK for Java for, well, the last 18 years. <laughs> um, and that's my area of expertise. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about um, using compilers for Java. Um, we recently open sourced all of our technology under two projects, Eclipse OMR and OpenJ9. I am a project lead for both of those. And um, I guess this talk started from a talk that I gave at the JVM Language Summit last year, uh, which was fairly well received. And, uh, but when, uh, when I gave that talk, it was more of a kind of conceptual talk. It was talking about the concepts of the trade-offs between using AOT and using just-in-time compilers and different types of compilers. Um, it didn't have a lot of sort of practical data in it or even any data in it. <laughs> so um, I've given that talk a few more times uh, over the last few months. And um, uh, for this talk, what I've done is I've tried to actually go off and run a whole bunch of the things that I was making broad statements about before. And I'm going to try to present some data. Uh, so uh, prepare to have your minds blown a little bit <laughs> at the end of this uh, because this is basically the next iteration of this talk uh, for, uh, for the audience. So you're, you get to see my first dry run <laughs> of this next version of the talk. So thank you for participating in that and I hope it doesn't disappoint. So I wanted to start off just by talking a little bit. I'm sure most people know this already, but the Java ecosystem is really amazing in terms of the amount of investment that's happened over the last more than 20 years in code compilation for Java applications. We've got a ton of different JIT compiler projects. Not all of them have survived to the current day, but you can see there's a long history of people investing in Hotspot, in the IBM SDK. There was a thing called JRocket once, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, we've got lots of different JITs happening uh, in using LLVM, and now the Grawl compiler is, uh, is entering the fray. There's been lots of investment here. There's been lots of investment historically in ahead-of-time compilation for Java even. Not very many people, I don't think, are using ahead-of-time compilers for their Java applications in production, but there's a long history of investment here trying to make this kind of technology work for us. Um, and I've listed a bunch of them there. Not all of them, again, still exist, but a, a, a number of them still are here. And then sort of the next generation of things here is trying to look at caching JIT code. So when a JVM compiles native code in, when it's running a Java application, the traditional model is you compile it, you store it in a code cache in memory, you use it while you're running that application, and when the application ends, poof, it's gone, that memory is deallocated, there's no more record of that, uh, that compiled method ever even existed. But the idea in caching JIT code is you store it into a persistent cache so that when you run that application again, you can pull that code out of the cache and just use it without having to go through that, all of that analysis that's needed to, to generate and compile it. And there are a couple of different, or actually three different implementations of that going forward. I'm actually going to talk about the next generation of that, uh, this technology in, in, uh, in, in this talk. Um, I wanted to pause here a little bit. Actually, uh, let me go one more further. So, um, I've, I've mentioned that there were a bunch of projects historically that have been in this space. These are kind of the main hitters uh, that are still here, right? <laughs> so Hotspot, probably everybody knows Hotspot. Probably everyone here is using Hotspot <laughs> uh, with its C1 client and C2 server uh, compilers. It's the default implementation of the JIT compiler that everyone's using. OpenJ9 uh, from the Eclipse Foundation is IBM's J9 JVM, which is a technology that we built over a couple of decades and that we've now contributed to open source so that everyone can use it. Uh, it has lots of interesting features that are different than uh, how Hotspot is designed. So it can do uh, the kinds of things that uh, you expect from C1, the kinds of things that you expect for C2, but it's a single technology base that's implementing all of that under the covers. Uh, and we also have this caching uh, JIT compilation approach, you know, which we we came up with a really crappy name for it called Dynamic AOT, uh, which is accurate, but nobody really likes the name. <laughs> um, Azul has uh, their Falcon JIT, which is based on LLVM, 
which they've been using uh, in the last few years and bringing it to some of their customers. It's a proprietary uh, JIT at this point. And uh, finally, the one that's uh, kind of grabbing some people's uh, attention uh, recently has been the Oracle Grawl compiler, which uh, is available as part of OpenJDK, uh, but it also has its own project right now. That, uh, um, and it's been used to do uh, primarily ahead of time compilation in the Java space, although it can be used as an experimental uh, tiered compiler. Um, so I wanted to pause here a little bit and just ask people, so <laughs> I'll go in reverse order. Is anyone here using Grawl? Sorry, has anyone here heard of Grawl? Let's start with that one. Okay, good. About half the room has heard of Grawl, maybe a little bit more. Is anyone using Grawl? JavaScript. It's kind of a half a hand coming up. All right. <laughs> All right. And not as a Java compiler. <laughs> okay, fine. How about who's heard of the Azul Zing compiler technology? Okay, a few, maybe five hands. Is anyone using Zing? No hands, okay. All right, <laughs> has anyone heard of Eclipse OpenJ9? Come on, lots of hands go up. We came and talked about it a few months ago. <laughs> All right, about half the room again, maybe a little bit less. Uh, is anyone using OpenJ9? Yay, all right. I wish I had a shirt for you, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> um, okay, and I assume everyone else knows about Hotspot and is using Hotspot. Is that nodding heads? Okay, everybody's pretty much using the reference JIT. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's very good information, thank you. All right, so the rest of the talk is gonna start kind of with the pieces that we have now, that we have today, that people have built today, and that some people are using around JIT compilation, ahead of time compilation, and uh, caching JITs, because those exist today. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how, to, how those things work, how they relate to each other, and, and even how you can use them. Um, and then talk a little bit about strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the second part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about um, sort of new work that we've been doing in OpenJ9, which is taking JIT compilers to the cloud. So the idea here is you can take the JIT compiler out of the JVM, make it its own independent service operating independently of the JVM client, and uh, basically you can offload all of the compilation work onto that server, leaving the client free to do whatever the application needs to do. And I'll talk about why you'd want to do that and what some of the implications, how it relates to the other technologies and why we think that's a, a good direction to move in. The new part of this talk, so I've kind of scrunched this, this, the first two sections existed in the previous talk, I've kind of scrunched them down a little bit. I'm not gonna go into as many of the ideas behind them uh, in order to make space for the some early measurements. So I literally generated some of this data earlier this afternoon. <laughs> um, and so what I wanted to do was to try to put some numbers to what the concepts, what the trade-offs were that I was talking about in, in the early part of the talk. And so uh, there's some pretty wicked graphs, uh, which I'm still trying to figure out exactly how to present. So maybe you can help me through that. <laughs> uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll uh, wrap up at the end with just kind of a, summary, a quick summary of what we've learned. Okay, so let's jump in. Just-in-time compilers. Um, this is pretty much the default everyone uses, right? So we're um, compiling code at the same time that the program is running. We're generating it typically into memory. Uh, we're going to uh, adapt to whatever the program is doing this time. So if your program does different things when you run it different times, the JIT can adapt to that. It can generate code that's optimized for the exact scenario that you're running right now. Uh, you can even adapt to the platform that you're running on right now. So the, if you run on Linux AMD 64, it will generate 64-bit x86 code. If you're running on a power processor or an ARM 64 processor, it can generate code for an ARM. So it's one of the things that gives Java its platform neutral um, uh, experience. After more than two decades of sustained effort here, there's been a lot of investment here from a lot of different vendors and uh, developers and open source communities. As, as I was mentioning before, there's a lot of investment here. Uh, the JIT is really the leader here in Java performance. And that's why most of you are probably using, uh, well, you are using, I already asked, you're using Hotspot. So that's why you're using it. <laughs> um, and that's despite multiple significant parallel AOT uh, performance efforts. So I'm trying to set you up to explain that like, there's, there's a trade-off in AOT. There's a lot of excitement around what AOT might bring, but there are some trade-offs that it brings as well. So why are JITs so great? What makes them good? 
there's a couple of things. And if you squint, they're really kind of the same thing. The first thing is that they speculate on class hierarchy. So um, calls, as you know, in Java are virtual by specification. Every call is virtual if it's not static or, or, uh, or a constructor. Um, um, but many of the calls that actually happen in the run of a Java application only have a single target. So they're defined to be virtual, but they really only go to one place. And so JIT compilers are able to watch the program as it's running and recognize that a call is only going to one place and treat it like it only goes to one place. They can generate code that can accommodate if it actually does go to multiple places, but it can make it really fast if you're going to the place that, it, uh, that there's one place that it's going to. Um, and, and then we can optimize aggressively. So it's not just that we know it goes to one place, it means we can optimize the code around that uh, target, the target of that call. So we can take advantage of the fact that we know it's going there. We know what fields it's going to access. We know what data it's going to do. We know what kinds of computations it's going to make. We can optimize that code altogether. Um, and the fact that we can speculate lets us greatly expand our ability to inline call targets, which is what really gives us that ability to optimize code together and generate really good code. Um, but one thing to keep in mind here is that if we compile methods too early, you know, if for those, for those calls that are going to go to multiple places, if you compile them really early, they'll look like they only go to one place. And then the JIT can, can make a misstep. It can say, hey, this looks like it only goes to one place. Let me inline this one thing. And then later on, it might turn out that there are, no, there actually are other targets, and they're actually more important than the one you inlined. So you have to be able to back out. But this, when you compile the code, can have an effect on how well the, the code is going to, to run. Now, JITs also use profile data um, that they collect as the program runs. So not just what classes are loaded, not just what, um, what methods are being called, but also what code paths are executing inside a method. They're measuring the different, you know, if you have an if-then-else statement, it knows how often the then part executes versus the else part. And it can use that to even more aggressively and speculatively optimize the code there. If you have, a, if you have an if-then-else and only one side is really executing, it can speculatively optimize that one side and make it go really fast which may have a negative effect on the one that doesn't happen very fast, that, that doesn't execute very often. Uh, but if it doesn't execute very often, that's okay. So we do lots of things like that in JIT compilers. Um, the fact that we can do this profile uh, uh, directed optimization is really an efficient way for the JIT compiler to achieve the same results that you would otherwise need a very elaborate and expensive compiler optimization to do. So something that, say, GCC would have to do in order to analyze C code, it can afford to go and look through an entire huge call chain of methods to figure out what exactly is going on through the whole uh, graph of, of, of methods that are being called. You can't afford to do that when you're running at the same time that the, that the program is running, right? If you spend a lot of effort on compiling, you'd better make sure you're going to have a payoff. And it's just really hard to ensure that when you're, when you're trying to do these things. So the... The great advantage of this profile data is that imagine something that's actually a constant value, right? So you set something to a constant value and then you flow that value through a whole big call graph of stuff. And right at the bottom, you have a use of that value, right? In order to prove that that value is a constant, I have to see all the code, all between there, all the loops, all the calls, everything, in order to prove that it's a constant. But if I'm profiling that value and I always see, like 100% of the time I see this value, I can be pretty sure it's going to be that value. It may not be. I'll have to hedge a little bit. But I can optimize as if it's that value, and I can make the code a lot faster than if I don't know what it is. So JIT compilers work really well when the profile data is really high quality, because that means the optimization, the speculative optimizations that it, do, that it does are going to work really well. But that performance advantage, it isn't free, right? So I need profile data. Profile data has an overhead. I have to record a bunch of values as the program is executing, which is usually done while the program is interpreting. So that's OK, because interpreters are generally slow. So yeah, make a slow thing a little bit slower. It's not so bad. We're going to compile it anyway, so it's going to go away. Um, and that usually works pretty well. Um, but it does mean that in that early stage of a program's execution, I'm going to make that, I have to make that even slower. And, and that means it's going to take time for Java applications to ramp up. 
to, to start up and ramp up, right? Everybody knows this, Java's big, it's heavy, it's fat, it takes a long time to get going, blah, blah, blah. And part of the reason for that is that we need all this information in order to just in time compile things. Uh, there's also the fact that JIT compilers consume transient resources, right? It takes, sorry to say, it takes CPU cycles and memory to actually do compilations while the application is running, right? Those are CPU cycles and bytes that the application might otherwise use to very good effect. But if I need them for the compiler, then the application can't use them. And so everything that the JIT compiler is doing is really borrowing from the application. It's well, stealing, really, that opportunity from the application to make f further progress on what it's doing. So um, just to give you a, a sort of rough guideline, you know, a JIT compile can take from under a millisecond to a small number of seconds. Right, that's kind of the range of, of time that it can take. And it can allocate up to hundreds of megabytes of memory. Right? So that's a pretty big transient performance effect happening you know, while your program is running. Um, and that cost is paid primarily while you're compiling code. When do you compile code? Mostly during startup and ramp up. <laughs> right? So this is another reason why, compile, why, why Java takes a long time to start up when you're using a JIT compiler, because all of that compiler activity is, is interfering with the, the progress of the application. Um, and it takes time to get to full speed because there might be thousands of methods to compile. Right? I can only compile so many methods at a time. <laughs> so if I got to get through a long queue of stuff, then I'm, you know, things go on the queue and I might have a queue of a thousand methods to go. Yeah, that, those methods all have to wait till they get to the front of the line and then they get compiled. So all of these things contribute to some of the slow startup and ramp up that you see with Java applications. Now there are also some persistent resource, uh, resources that get consumed by the compiler. There are things called runtime assumptions and that profile data that I mentioned, right? These are things that persist even outside of the time that you spend <laughs> compiling a method. And those are just uh, overheads that are required in order to, to handle all of the requirements of the JIT compiler. For the most part, these aren't large parts of the, of the, the memory footprint, uh, but they are there. So if I was going to sort of summarize everything that I just said, um, and maybe a few things I didn't, uh, I, <laughs> I create this little chart, and I'll, I'm going I'm to give a sort of a traffic light assignment of how well JIT compilers do on a variety of different fronts, right? So code performance at steady state, really good, right? Once you've compiled everything, the compiler does a great job of generating good code and your program runs like stink. Um, it has the ability to adapt to change. So if your application is changing its own behavior, the JIT compiler can react to that because it's running at the same time that the application is running. It's really easy to use. Who here knows how to disable the, the JIT compiler in the JVM? Do you remember the command line option that does it? Zero hand. Oh, one hand. Do you remember? What's the option? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yes, not really. <laughs> so, that's how good it is, right? We've forgotten how to disable it, right? If I had asked that question 20 years ago, bang, your whole room would have known exactly how to disable it, <laughs> right? You would have laughed at me for even asking the question. <laughs> um, so, uh, and so it's really easy to use for people. They don't even think about it anymore. Uh, it just works. Platform neutrality, uh, as I mentioned, it doesn't matter what platform you start your Java application on, it just goes, right? Yeah, okay, if you're using native code and JNI, blah, 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 whatever. But if you're just running pure Java code, the JIT compiler just deals with it, right? Whatever the platform you're running on, it, it, it works. And, and again, you don't really have to think about it too much. However, um, as I mentioned, there's some issues with startup and ramp up, right? So these are two terms that I'm going to use throughout the talk, so I should probably you know, define them a little bit right now. Um, most people just use the word startup, but I like to break it down into two different sections. So startup is, when it, is how long it takes to get to the point where your application or your server is ready to do work, right? Ramp up is after there's work to do, how long does it take to get to the steady state performance that you expect from doing that work, right? And there's a reason from my perspective why I do that is because they actually are very different kinds of workloads and you do very different things in the JVM and in the JIT compiler and in AOT compilers and in caching JIT compilers and in JIT servers to target those two different use cases because you need different heuristics to get them right. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, the last point I mentioned, if you look at the runtime CPU and memory requirements of having a JIT compiler, you know, they're not great, right? It's adding a whole bunch of memory and CPU cycles. So I'm going to give those last three red 
Um, and the first four I'm going to call green. Now, everyone hopes <laughs> that AOT is going to come along and solve these red boxes, right? That, that startup thing, that ramp up thing, we want to get code performance right away. We don't want to wait. We don't want all this memory stuff. So can't AOT help? All right, so let's talk about AOT a bit. So there's two basic options here to do ahead of time compiled code. One is, uh, actually they're both implemented using the Grawl compiler, but they're, um, they're exposed differently. So JAOTC is a compiler that you can use uh, in JDK 9 and after. Uh, it's available as an experimental compiler option uh, with OpenJDK. And then there's the native image um, uh, program that you can run or compiler that you can run as part of the Grawl VM CE or EE if you're willing to pay money um, project which uses Substrate VM. So what's the idea here? The idea here is you're going to take an extra step to generate native code. You're going to look at the application and you're going to generate native code for all those methods that you would otherwise JIT compile when you're starting up and running the application. You're going to generate that ahead of time compiled code. You're going to store it into something like a shared object on Linux, say, DLL on Windows. And, and you're just going to load that code in one blop and everything's going to be wonderful, right? It's very similar to the approach that you take with less dynamic languages like Rust or C++ or, or whatnot. Right, um, and um, there is some some. It's starting to have good platform support here. We have Linux x86 and NAR64 is now supported or coming, depending on the on, on which exact one you're going to use. So, just to to show you a little bit more sort of hands-on how this stuff works. So, if you're going to use JAOTC, for example, um, there's a new uh, launcher that's provided in the in Java Home that slash bin called JAOTC, you give it uh, an output option which tells it I want to generate this library.so guy. Um, it's only available after JDK 9, which means modularity is, is uh, in full force. So a lot of methods from or classes from java.base are going to get used. So you want to be able to compile those. That's what this option provides. And then you give a jar file. This is the jar you're going to compile. And you can also have it search, have a search deer kind of like class path for finding other things that are in your application. Um, there's a couple of extra options which are quite handy. Uh, one is this compile for tiered guy here. <laughs> here. <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, by default, if you compile AOT code this way, it's not built with any profiling hooks. And so you can't rejit that code. You'll get whatever the AOT compiler did, and it will never be rejitted. Uh, if you use the compile for tiered, what that does is it adds additional hooks into the AOT code so that the JIT can determine that that method is executing a lot, and it can run the JIT compiler, and, and you can get um, even higher performance. That compile commands file, this guy here, I'll get better at this, sorry. <laughs> um, this allows you to tell the compiler to only compile certain methods. And this is really useful. I didn't get a chance to actually uh, expand on this in the talk, but um, by default you could just say, look at everything my application could possibly run and just AOT compile it and everything will be happy. But as it turns out, that's an awful lot of methods <laughs> and an awful lot of classes and it generates an awful lot of native code, which is probably not practical to package your application up together and there's going to be a lot of stuff in there that you're never going to use at runtime. So there are options with, um, with, the, the, with OpenJDK with Hotspot, which I didn't list here, but I'm, I, have a, I can show you on my laptop after the talk if you're interested, um, for ways that you can get a Hotspot to log which methods were actually touched during a run. And then you can spit that out as a file. You can post process that with some fun string processing stuff to, uh, <laughs> to get them into the format that the compile commands option expects. And then you can have it just AOT compile those methods that were actually touched in your program run, uh, which reduces greatly the size of the library, makes it a bit more effective uh, in, in uh, effective for use. Um, so anyway, so you generate this library.so and then, well, you have to run your Java application, right? So that's what this second bullet, I'm still not good at this, um, <laughs> here. So in order to do this, you have to unlock your experimental VM options, right? It's an experimental thing. They like to emphasize that. And then this dash XX AOT library where you specify the library name, what that does is it tells the JVM, load this code, you know, uh, bind it into the JVM so that when things call the methods that are in here, it should go to that AOT code instead of uh, 
being interpreted uh, slash jitted. And then you just run your application. It's a, it's a, the basic idea is similar for native image, which is the substrate VM approach here. I'm not going to go into detail here. There are lots of talks that go into this, so I'm not going to cover it in much detail. Um, native image does do a much more aggressive global optimization of the code that's in your application. So it's trying to do a reachability analysis to find all the methods that your program could possibly run, and it will try to optimize the crap out of just those methods, as if those are the only methods in your universe. Um, in the compiler world, we call that closing the world because Java is a very open-ended world. It, you can dynamically load classes, you can create classes, you can spit bytes into an array and create a class from it, right? <laughs> um, and you can do whatever you want with that. So, but in this world, when you close the world, you can no longer do that. There's no longer an ability to dynamically load classes. And that means that you can apply compiler analyses to the code that you know about. If you were able to dynamically load something, then that might break the assumptions that your analysis um, learned, and therefore your code would be broken. And in this native image world, you don't have a JIT. You don't have an interpreter, because there's no even bytecodes. So you don't have an ability to recover if you make a mistake. And so, go ahead. Yep. Question? Uh, just a question on that. Does that mean yep. like things like CGLS don't store it? Stuff that generates bytecode dynamically? Yes. Not, yes. Not, okay, yes. So it does mean that. <laughs> you cannot dynamically load code in a native image form. It just doesn't work. Um, that's a fundamental limitation of the approach. Again, because they're trying to do the reachability analysis and take into account exactly what they can see. So if they can't see what code you're going to generate, there's no way to take it into account as far as I know. I don't know specifically CGLib, but it, yeah, I mean, it, like it makes like sense to me. That, that's the limitation that, that is frequently like, so talked about. Things like the JDK dynamic proxy doesn't work? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So these are some of the limitations associated with this. Some of these things you can kind of predict what's going to, what it's going to do, and you can accommodate. So there are, there are some very interesting things that the Grohl team and that the Quarkus team have done to try to make it work better. Um, but the fundamental limitation is you cannot, if there's, if the ability is, if the, if there's an ability to dynamically build a class that doesn't exist at analysis time, it, it, you can't do it. It can't handle that. Uh, at least in its current form. So this currently generates a completely self-contained executable. So unlike the other approach here, here, here right? Thank you. <laughs> well, you don't, you, you don't like my finger? Yeah, that just makes your life easier. Oh, where am I here? Push the red button. The red there button. There. Uh, so here, I'm running Java, and I'm passing a library.so here. I need a cat to jump on it now. <laughs> right? <laughs> we'll call him Pascal. Um, all right, so, uh, <laughs> but here, you're, you're actually running a self-contained executable. You're not running Java anymore because there is no Java. There's no bytecodes. There's no classes. It's just a blob of stuff, code. <laughs> um, and it will, if it has to allocate objects and whatever, it will do that as part of its own executable. It embeds everything into that executable. Uh, but it's no longer uh, a Java program. Um, and there are projects like Red Hat's Quarkus here, which makes it easier to use. So it helps accommodate some projects that do some kinds of uh, uses of reflection and other things that cause entry points that you can't easily find uh, in your application. And the, um, the native image uh, static analysis needs to know about every possible entry point to the program. All right. So what should you expect from using AOT compiled code uh, in, to run a Java program? So clearly it has some runtime advantages over a JIT compiler, right? It's kind of around those red boxes that we saw before, right? Um, you're going to get code performance right away, right? Either you're loading an executable that has native code in it or you're loading a shared object that's got native code already generated, already ready to go in it. So you're going to get compiled code performance immediately, which means you're going to get faster startup for your servers and it's going to eliminate or at least reduce a lot the CPU and memory impact that you would otherwise have with a JIT compiler in play, right? So all those sound like great things, but there are some pretty other, there are some other aspects that you might want to be aware of, 
right? So there are some challenges with this approach. First off, they're generating native code, right? So you're back into a world where now I've got native code that's tied to a platform that I, if I happen to run on multiple platforms, I have to generate a different bundle for each platform, make sure it gets to the right place. If I run on you know, one version of an x86 processor, did I use instructions that might not exist on another x86 processor that it's going to run on? Right? All these kinds of issues that people you know, <laughs> deal with in the C++ and Rust and other environments, um, you know, all of those are in Java again, which people aren't usually used to at this point in there. <laughs> We've been using JITs for 20 years. We're used to it being platform neutral and not having to worry about all that stuff. Well, guess what? It comes back with AOT. And there are some other usability issues here, right? So there are a lot of things that get embedded into the code when you build it, like what GC policy you're using. If you build the code for running with G1, you can't then just decide you're going to run with parallel GC or parallel CMS, or whatever, right? You can't just change those kinds of things. You have to regenerate new native code that has the hooks in it that are appropriate, you know, the right write barriers for the GC, or the right thing it's got a call to allocate an object. Um, you, you may get exposed to the fact that your application may run and load different classes and run different methods on different platforms, even in the JCL, right? There's the JCL can know what it's running on. It knows if it's running on Windows or if it's running on Linux. And how does it interact with the console? How does it interact with other parts of the, of the system? So there are platform dependent parts of the class libraries that can be accommodated very easily in the JIT compiler because it knows it's running on one platform. It only has to generate the code for that one platform. In the AOT world, now you have to accommodate that. You have to, again, generate different code for different platforms. Right, so that process, sorry, I'll let you ask in a, in a second. <laughs> um, when, when you're um, coming up with that list of methods that are touched by your program when it runs, if there's different platforms that you want to run, you're going to have to run it on different platforms and get different lists and make sure you use the right list on the right platform. Those kinds of, you get those kinds of issues. I'll pause okay. for your question. You said the different AOT needed for different uh, deployment platform. Like yeah. Yeah. Does Docker help with that? Because that's why, that's it, my understanding. It can, but it doesn't help uh, across different hardware platforms, right? So you can't take an x86 uh, program and run it on an ARM64 yeah, machine, it's right? Ninety-nine percent of um, was it um, hardware centered? Yeah. Using the right platform. Yeah. yeah. Or using Intel CPUs. It's true. It's true, but not all of them. <laughs> and there are people who want to run on ARM because it's lower power, right? There's a, there's a huge emphasis in the data centers to try to reduce power, and ARM is much more power efficient than an x86 processor is. And then there's other reasons. There are other processor types. I'm from IBM, so I get to tell you about IBM processors, right? So we have IBM Power. We have uh, IBM Z, so mainframes. So I, I don't know how many people here work in sort of the banking system or insurance or those kinds of industries, but mainframes are there, right? And they run Java code. They've been running Java code for decades. So you have to accommodate these kinds of things, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, might be wrong, but it's, it still sounds like a solution for the hardware embedded systems. Uh, is that the case? Would be for a very small set of systems to console hardware? Um, well, I mean, if you're... If you're running on different, if you're running on different platforms, then you have to accommodate it. Not everybody will. I'm, I'm not trying to say everybody will, but if you are, if you want your Java application, or you anticipate ever your Java application wanting to run on more than one different platform, you're going to have to deal with this kind of issue, right? And it, and it doesn't just show up in the hardware platform. It also shows up in how the code gets generated, right? So as I mentioned, the GC policy, there are other command line options that you can use that change how the code gets generated, which. You're not exposed to that right now because you're using JIT compilers that know which options got set on the command line and they just do the right thing. It's completely transparent to you. But if you start using AOT, you're going to get exposed to that sort of thing. And so you'll get cases where you'll generate AOT code and you'll, you'll go through that whole process of saying Java dash XX AOT library equals blah, and then it won't get used because the library won't be compatible with the way you're running the application. Right? And it actually happens silently unless you add another option to tell you what's going on with the AOT library. Question. How does the default AOT compile and put a stack trace when things go wrong? Uh, it so should. It there. should. I don't, I don't actually know that because I didn't check if exceptions yeah. are there, but it should actually work just fine. Another question at the back. Uh, what, what percentage of the code like for apps, stuff that you have to jet 
from the core JDK, like Java dot Java X, yeah. versus applications. Mm. Like, you guys have, <laughs> do you have any data on that? Uh, I don't actually. Um, it kind of depends. I mean, it's going to depend a lot on what you're actually running and how many frameworks you're pulling in, right? right? It, 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 there tends to be, a, it's kind of like an iceberg thing, right? Like you start with a little piece of code at the top <laughs> and then under the, it, it refers to something under the surface and then that can end up with a yeah, huge I, dependency chain of stuff. The reason why I'm asking is I could imagine yeah. hypothetically that yeah. Certain parts of the JDK always get executed by certain types of apps all yeah. the time. There so are, you wouldn't, you wouldn't yeah. need to guess much about them. That's true. That is, that is certainly true. The, the, the area where it gets troublesome is an application changes, right? You're continually changing applications, right? You're adding new features. You're doing new things. Well, okay, unless you're in <laughs> maintenance mode. But if you're continually changing your application, then the things that it's using, you're adding new dependencies, you're adding new methods, you're calling new things in the JDK. So yes, there will be a certain stability in the kinds of things that most applications deal with, but there's going to be stuff on the fringes, and you know whether that's going to be performance sensitive or not is the sort of operational question here. Wouldn't it also be true that some of those standard library things like hash map get, hash map put, yep. they're going to get inlined and yep. some, of, some of the sanity checks will be eliminated by the yes. compiler. So especially the JIT, in, especially uh, the JIT compiler, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Even if it's in the standard library, it might yep. not be the same code even yep. if it's compiled. Yep. And, and you'll see later in the talk, assuming I get there, is uh, you'll see some of the performance implications of some of these things. So I'll try to put a little bit more numbers around that. I don't have an answer to your specific question, but hopefully it'll help at least a little bit. All right. Um, so I was kind of in the middle here. So it, they're basically, there are these lists of classes and modules that you need to use in order to make this um, uh, useful in the JAOTC example, right? Uh, native image just does all the reachability analysis for you, but JAOTC, you need to manage a list of classes and modules. That can change over time uh, as your dependencies evolve. Um, you have to worry about classes that aren't available even for JOTC. If, if a class isn't available until runtime, you can't AOT compile that, right? There's no way of referring to it necessarily. Um, and you always have to look at what methods to compile. And so from a performance standpoint, the, ish, the, the challenge here for the AOT compiler is that it, it can't know what's happening at runtime because you're actually compiling up front. Um, and um, unlike the JIT compiler. So I have a, a nice little visualization that I um, have shortened for this talk. <laughs> um, but basically, if you think about a running a Java application, it kind of poofs into existence at some point, right? You run Java command, and all of a sudden, there's a process, and there's a heap, and there's stuff, and there's classes. Well, before all those things get created, the process gets created, right? And that's kind of your big bang. And then over time, you know, um, so I've drawn this as kind of the the number of classes that are getting loaded in your application, it's expanding over time, right? When you, when you get to the point where your application's about to run main, right? So the JDK is being initialized and loaded. There might be 750 classes and about three class loaders with only one of them actually being primarily used. By the time your application is ready to do work, right? That startup period that I talked about before, you might have loaded thousands of classes and Hundred, sorry, tens of thousands, or thousands of classes, and there might be hundreds of class loaders if you're using an OSGI framework, right? Not every application is going to be like this, but there are applications that are on this kind of scale. And then, you know, from that point forward, get my line here, right? Now your application starts running its, its, uh, its code paths. Eventually, they'll stabilize. It doesn't usually mean you're loading lots of additional things, but a compiler needs to learn about what's executing in this, in this section here. It's learning from your application to see what's important to compile and how to compile it so that it can generate the code that's going to give you the highest performance. And then eventually you stabilize, right? You kind of hit your, sta your steady state and things just kind of run normally, right? Different applications will have phases, but they'll have, they, they tend to operate in kind of a block of time where things are relatively stable. Then they might change to something else relatively stable. Some of them are just stable for their whole lives. They're just running transactions in a server, whatever. All right. And so uh, why does this matter for AOT and JIT? So, so the JIT is inside this process. It can see all of those classes, everything that got loaded. It knows exactly what they're doing. It can watch them while they're running. But AOT is over here on this side here, 
it can only look at this whole process through the Big Bang, right? None of the stuff that actually gets created in memory, in the heap, in the classes that get loaded, the class loaders that get created, none of that stuff exists outside of the application from a compiler's perspective, right? So it has to reason about what's going to happen at runtime. And the reason why I call it the Big Bang is because all this stuff just, just kind of pop into existence, right? And none of it exists ahead of time. So the compiler is really restricted here in trying to figure out all of this complexity and be able to optimize it well. And that's hard, it really is. All right, so what if we were to use profile-directed feedback, right? A lot of people have you know, used PDF in the static compiler world uh, when they're running their C++ programs or whatnot. The, the, there are still issues here, though, because AOT code still has to run for all possible user executions, right? The JIT compiler is inside one execution. It knows exactly what that one's doing. AOT has to be generated up front, and then every possible execution has to be handled by it. So that necessarily means you have to hedge your bets on certain things. Um, so you're no longer compiling for this user on this run. You have, to, you, know, you, have to, you have to hedge. And you have to basically provide representative input so that you don't mislead the AOT compiler into thinking, this is the common thing that's always going to happen. Well, except for all that other stuff that always happens. <laughs> right? If you mislead the AOT compiler, it might try to optimize something that's actually the wrong thing to optimize. And it's the data sets that you provide to AOT when you're doing profile-directed feedback. That's how you tell the compiler what you think is going to be common. But it's hard to tell that. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. So um, the other thing to realize here is that benchmarks are um, also um, possibly susceptible to this problem, right? Benchmarks are kind of built around assuming that there's a JIT, right? They sort of, they assume that, well, it doesn't matter what the input set really is for the benchmark because the JIT's going to just adapt to it anyway. So we'll just measure a few things. But that may not be the representative thing to do for an AOT compiler. So you have to be really careful when you're using benchmarks with AOT compiling as well, right? Um, and then on top of that, those input sets are things that need to be curated because they might change as your users evolve, as your scenarios evolve that you care about. Uh, and so on. So really, there's this, there's this uh, notion of having to curate a bunch of information, meta information about your application and how it runs and what's important to your run so that you can properly tell the AOT compiler what to do so that it can do the best job that it can. And I'm going to make an observation here without any data whatsoever <laughs> that PDF, this profile-directed feedback approach, hasn't really been a tremendous success for static languages, right? It's not the thing that everybody uses in every compile, right? It's... A few, a few people use it, they've gotten some benefits out of it. It's usually hard to make it work over a long period of time and get, and get really good results. All right, so returning to my chart, <laughs> I've added an AOT column, and yes, I did manage to convert the lower three boxes from red to green, <laughs> right? We did make startup fast, we did make ramp up good, um, and we got rid of all that CPU and memory being consumed by the JIT compiler, <laughs> but, <laughs> We are probably going to have lower code performance. We can no longer adapt at runtime to changes because we had to deal with it all up front. Um, it's not all that easy to use, right? There's all these other things that I have to worry about and now think about uh, when I'm using AOT code. And I'm not platform neutral anymore. So that kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> so um, is there any kind of happy medium here? Well, yes. I did mention that JAOTC has that option, dash dash compile for tiered which adds profile hooks into the AOT code uh, so that it can be rejitted. And that means you can kind of get an AOT start, you can get some of the benefits of startup, ramp up, and, and the runtime aspects um, uh, because you're not jitting everything, but you still do need to rejit some things in order to get that top performance. So I've taken away some of the green boxes, right? The ramp up, because you're going to have to rejit stuff, that means your ramp up's going to slow down again. So I took that to an orange box. Um, you've got a JIT compiler, so that means you've got CPU and, and memory being consumed again while your application runs, so I'm going to call that a red box. And then, you know, you're going you're gonna to make up on the steady state performance, presumably, because the JIT compiler is going to get you, it's going to top you up to the same level that it would otherwise achieve, in principle. <laughs> um, and since you have a JIT, you can adapt at runtime to things that are going on. So this is a little bit optimistic. Uh, as you'll see from the data later, maybe. Um, but, uh, but that's the score that I'm going to give it. So 
is that as good as it gets? Um, uh, no, you can cache it compiles. I mentioned this before. Question at the back. I just had a quick question. Does, does the ahead of time compilation affect how like threads happen and how people like detect that blocks aren't being used? No. No. So there be no. impact. In those particular and specifically for JOTC, AOTC, it's building a Java compliant native code. So it's just like the JIT generating native code for so for the, the runtime. So people put synchronized, but it's not needed. It can avoid that. Uh, in yeah, if it can see the code, yes. Um, it, it, it may not be able to tell in all cases that it can remove it, but, but, um, but yes, it, it's capable of doing those kinds of things still. Uh, and native image even better to some extent because it can, it, it can assume that it doesn't, it can't see any other code that's, that's doing it, right? Um, let's see. So the idea here is instead of generating AOT code up front, we're going to, store JIT code as it's being compiled. We're going to store it into a cache. And then later on, in other runs, we can just load that code out of that cache. We don't have to compile it again. Why would we compile it again? How many times do I really need to compile string.index of? Um, it, 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 it just gets compiled, right? <laughs> Once. So it, this is, is this really different than AOT? No and yes. So from the perspective of the first JVM, I'm doing a JIT compilation, right? This is not, I'm doing the run, I'm doing the compile while the program is running. So I have access to all the same information that the JIT compiler has. And I can just embed that into the AOT code. I have to be careful that I don't use that code in a scenario where it's not legal. But, um, but I'm, I can compile that code as if I'm the JIT compiler. And then I store it in the cache. And then from other JVM's perspectives, I'm loading that code and, and just using it. So that's kind of like AOT. So that's why it's sort of like AOT, but it's sort of not. Um, it brings us back to platform neutrality because I'm doing JIT compiles. Um, uh, and different users are still getting code tailored for their environment because it's happening when you run the program, not before. There are two basic implementations of this, one which is OpenJ9, one which is Azul's Falcon JIT. I'm only going to talk about the first one. Um, very quickly, because I'm running a little bit over in terms of time. Yes. Um, <laughs> we do all kinds of good stuff. We store uh, compiled code. We store classes. We store profile data and hints. We can store all kinds of stuff into our cache and reuse it in, uh, in OpenJ9. There's even an option, Xtune Virtualized, which can use it even more aggressively during ramp up. Traditionally, we use it for startup only, right? So remember that startup, getting, getting the server up and ready to do work. Um, there is a performance impact to using cached code because you have to be able to accommodate the fact that this, the, the scenario where that code is loaded may not match what the scenario is when the, when the JIT is running. Right? The JIT can assume I'm in the process, I know what's happening. Um, but for EOT, it cannot. All right, so if we add that into our table, um, it helps a little bit more with startup and ramp up because we're getting code in that second run at least. We get code right away, so startup and ramp up can be fast. However, we're still in this process where we still have to spend some effort to load that code in. We still have to spend some effort to compile that code in the first process. So I only gave an orange box for, for the runtime impact. And the code performance, as I mentioned, there is some impact to doing this. So you get a little bit of a drop in performance. All right, so still not everything green there, right? So um, what else can we do? <laughs> so uh, oh, an agenda slide I forgot to update. Um, taking JITs to the cloud. So the next idea here is, so the big, part, the big drawback of JITs is that they're consuming resources at runtime. So what if we could take the JIT out of the JVM and put it somewhere else? Give it independent resources that wouldn't affect what's going on in the JVM that's running the actual application. So the idea is here we could, we could create these JIT servers uh, over here, which can do compilations. They can send code to these JVMs to run, and they no longer need to have their own JIT. So all of the impact of this JIT compiler goes away and all of the performance characteristics of this JVM are now dictated by the application that you're running, not this uh, wonderful, fantastic compiler that steals CPU t cycles and, and gigabytes or, or megabytes of memory, <laughs> right? Um, uh, and we can do it all somewhere else, assuming that you can afford to, to, to you know, allocate these guys. And then we can do load balancing, we can do affinity scaling, it can run it just like any other service, right? The benefits here, Yes. Yes. <laughs> so the benefits here are that we've moved all of those CPU and memory spikes that you might otherwise see when running a Java application somewhere else. Um, and so uh, 
the, but the JIT server is still connected to the JVM that's running. So it still has access to all of that dynamic data. It can still generate really, really good code. And so at the bottom here, I've showed, this is actually a measurement, but, uh, but the idea is if you, if you are allocating, if you're watching how much memory is being consumed by your application, if you're just running without, with the, your, your traditional JIT compiler, the JIT compiler is doing all this memory activity to compile methods, right? And eventually it stabilizes because it doesn't have to do any compiles anymore and you have this nice steady state thing. But if you're running with a JIT server, then all that compiler workload moves somewhere else. And so the, you get this nice smooth memory footprint graph for the client, which becomes much more predictable, easy to write, uh, easy to uh, uh, proportion resources for your, your JVM. Could it really work? Well, okay, here's some measurements that we show running Acme Air, um, which is a, a it, it models a flight reservation system. It's a JEE 7 benchmark. It's something that we've used to measure performance on a lot of different scenarios. Um, here we're showing uh, JIT server, that there's two examples here. We're showing a cold run here using shared classes, so the, the caching approach, and the warm run. So this is where it's populating a cache, it's doing lots of compiles, and here's where it's using most of the code from the cache, but it still has to do the top up compiles using the JIT in order to get, this is the ramp up. So you can think of this as kind of startup and this is ramp up. Right? So in the cold run, we have to generate all the methods that we're going to use at startup, right? So the JIT compiler is delayed by the fact that you have to do all of those compiles and steal resources from the application. The JIT server can offload all of that stuff and get performance a lot faster. It can deliver performance to the JVM client that much faster, even in the cold run. In the warm run, well, you're loading, now those, a lot of those methods got stored as cached JIT compiles. So you get fast startup in both scenarios, but there's still this ramp up curve that you get with the JIT compiler in process that you can avoid with the JIT server. So you can do all of those top up compiles and still get to the same level of performance in the end. Now, these are OpenJ9 ones. I know you guys are all using Hotspot. Um, in terms of startup performance, Hotspot takes twice as long as OpenJ9 to, come to start up, even in the case where you're not using a JIT server. And you may not believe me on that, but I'll show you some data later. I, I wanna just point out, these are the very constrained environment, right? This is one processor and 150 megs of memory. So that's, that's the environment that it has to run in. We've run other benchmarks where we've tried hard to push on the amount of memory that's available to the JVM to run. So if in here, if you've got lots of memory, this application you can kind of get, you can do very well here because you've got lots of memory free to do your compiles and do whatever you want. So the throughput curves are almost identical. As you start to lower the amount of memory that you give to the, to the JVM to run in, now the, the JIT compiles that are happening are a lot harder to get done because it, it ends up peaking against the, the amount of memory that it has available to it. And so what OpenJ9 does in that case is it knows it's getting close to the limit and it, and it throws the compile away. It says, I'm not gonna compile this because it would blow my memory limit and it's gonna go outside of the resource constraint that you told me to use. And what that means is you don't get compiled code for that method. You have to back off to a lower optimization level and get worse, like lower performing code. And so you can start to see that happening here, right, where with, with a local JIT, some of those compiles aren't able to happen and so you get lower performance than you would get from the JIT server, which is able to send those compiles somewhere else. And then finally, if you lower the, the memory even further, you start to see an even more drastic thing happening with the performance of the local JIT compiler, right? So now, this is where you're pushing really hard on the container limits. You're trying to pack things as densely as possible. Um, but what you can see is that the JIT server allows you to, to maintain almost the same level of throughput, even with, you know, 33% less memory limit than you had in the original one. Right? So it's, it's allowing you to use the memory more effectively to deliver performance, which means you can pack things more densely, you can more efficiently run your programs. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> isn't the network latency associated with talking to that, that pesky JIT server, isn't that gonna hurt? Isn't it, is it really gonna be practical in something like the cloud? So we did some measurements on Amazon, and yes, um, it, it does actually, so this is the graph, you'll recognize this graph from before. This is running the JVM, this is running the Acme Air application. This now it's four cores at this point, so it's not, not the super constrained environment as before. But you can see that it's actually managing to move all of the JIT uh, compile work off, off, off load, and it's able to actually ramp up almost as fast. And in fact, later on, it actually gets 
to uh, its peak performance, which is almost where the local JIT can get to, uh, a little bit faster. So, and again, that's because you're offloading resources to somewhere else. So if I were to add that to my table, I'm almost all green now, right? Although there's still, I had to make a, I had to put a second asterisk here, right? So this is first run across the cluster if I'm gonna reuse code now, right? Um, and there still is some memory actually and CPU, it's actually more CPU than memory that's required in order to manage this compiler. This remote compiler is asking questions back to the JVM and the network traffic that has to go forward, uh, back and forth there. The impact of that is actually CPU cycles. So in fact, uh, it's kind of amazing. When we started this, we, uh, we took the JIT compiler, we moved it over to another process, and then we, we measure, one of the measurements that we do internally is looking at how, many, how much CPU consumption there is on the compiler threads inside the JVM. And the first time that we did that, the, the number of CPU cycles compiled by the compiler threads, even when we're moving all of the compiler compilations off to another machine even, and the amount of CPU cycles we were consuming went up by a factor of 10. 10. <laughs> so we were quite... Um, uh, we had a lot of hubris, I guess. We thought compilation had to be one of the most computationally intensive things you could possibly do. But it turns out that sending network messages back and forth is a lot more computationally intensive than, <laughs> <laughs> than doing compilations. So anyway, so we've gone through an exercise of uh, caching answers, uh, collapsing messages together, optimizing basically that network traffic that's going across the wire. And so that's one of the reasons why we can tolerate more, uh, more network latency there. And then the other reason is that we can maintain parallel connections. So we can do many more compiles on the server in parallel than we can afford to do inside the JVM client itself. Question? Does your cache make it possible if I start uh, the same application in 10 JVMs to talk to one JIT server? Yes. <laughs> So yes, you can, connect, you can connect multiple JVMs to the same server. However, at the current implementation is not able to really share those compile, that compile workload across different JVMs. So you'll get, you'll get 10 times the workload of one JVM on the server. The process that we're going through right now is trying to shrink that so that you can reuse more of the compilation work on the server. So you don't need to allocate a huge server in order to serve a cluster of JVMs. I'm just thinking in like a horizontally scaled yep. by yep. instances. Absolutely. The network latency will not be an issue if I have to, if I do it once in a central oh, JIT yep. server yep. and I serve it a million times. Yep, yep. So the use of the shared class cache is one way in which that helps. If you can have all those different instances sharing through a shared class cache, the compile work can get stored into that cache and then everyone can benefit from it. So, so that can help to some extent, but we're, we're trying to do even better. Yes, it can handle, it knows, it knows what's going on. It can tell if one class is the same as another. If it is the same class, then it can reuse. Um, it, it, there, is the, there is that ability to reuse code, especially at the shared class cache level. Question? So, they say I've uh, used uh, Orcas yep. to compile microservices. Yep. Just like the small footprint that it delivers. Yep. One thing is uh, observability, because uh, they were looking we're relying a lot on yep. JMX. Yep. And I've been looking at perhaps converting the JMX into some perhaps D trace and so on. So I've been looking at some something. Uh, That's a problem that the community has been wrestling with as right. well. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yep. So yep. have you seen anything that you, um, uh, the community the, the community certainly knows about it. I don't know the D traces where they're going uh, in that particular area, but I know it's a problem the, with the with the native image approach. So I'm gonna try to show some data on a Quarkus application that I ran as well. All right, so let me just quickly go through current status. This is the first talk where I've actually been able to say, you can download this and try it out. So you could go to Adopt Open JDK today, download the most latest update for JDK up uh, 8 and 11 on Linux x86-64 systems, and you can use it. And it's really, really easy to use. So there's a new launcher inside the, the JDK in the Java home slash bin directory. Um, you can just run JIT server, tell it a port to listen on and what uh, address, actually that's not supposed to be there. Um, <laughs> you run it on the host. <laughs> this one's down here, sorry, uh, here. I'll take that away. Um, and then on the client, you run it with this dash xs plus use JIT server, tell it which port, 
and which address, and then run your Java app. And that's it. That's, at that point, you're using the remote JIT to do JIT compilations. So it's really easy to use. Um, and we're now at the point where we're trying to seek feedback from people. So if you're interested in this kind of technology, I'd really encourage you to try it out. And please get in touch with me and let me know <laughs> how it goes. Like if, if, you, yeah. if your JIT server goes down, will it fall back? Yes. Okay. Yes. So there, has, there actually is still a local JIT inside the JVM that's running. It's the thing that's talking to the remote JIT. And so, in fact, there are some scenarios where we don't do a remote JIT because it would be too expensive to send all the data across, do the jitting over there, and bring it back. If it's a really uh, low optimization compile of a very small method, we actually have the ability to do that locally because it's not going to impact anything. It's not going to have a high impact on the JVM client, and so why not just do it locally? Right? What's the JIT server written in? Is it written in Java or? C++. Yeah. OpenJ9 is a combination of C, C++, and Assembler. Um, and there's lots of other cool stuff that we can do with this. So, right, uh, so we talked a little bit about trying to shrink the, the workload so that we can do more, um, uh, fewer compilations to serve a large number of JVM clients, right? Microservices is really the environment where we're trying to build this for, right? That's the use case that we're thinking of here because microservices can roll out to tens or even hundreds of microservices. And if you have a compiler, a JIT compiler, compiling the same things over and over again in all of those different JVMs, it just doesn't make sense. Um, we want to be able to reuse that. We want to be able to use uh, machine learning to start classifying and categorizing JVM clients so we know that this client, these clients are operating in similar ways so we can optimize them in similar ways and reuse the code across them in similar ways automatically, transparently, just the way the JIT server, sorry, just the way the JIT compiler works for you today. Um, and then in principle, we can start optimizing groups of microservices together under the covers so that you're not even aware that it's happening. All right. This is the part that I have never included in this talk before. It took me a long time actually to get through this. <laughs> Longer than I thought it would, sorry. Um, so I, the, the, in the Quarkus, uh, so Quarkus is a project that was started by Red Hat, uh, which was built around trying to make very lightweight servers for the Java ecosystem, right? Very fast startup. Um, and uh, they have an interesting way of, they can, they can run in two basic modes. They can run in JVM mode or they can run in native image mode, which means they can run Java applications using Java in the traditional way, which are very lightweight and start quickly. Or they can use, they could take advantage of the Grawl uh, native image process to generate a native image executable, which also obviously starts very quickly and has low footprint. Um, and so um, I, uh, took advantage of a benchmark that the Quarkus team has generated uh, previously to do some performance analysis on Quarkus, looking at these two different modes. And um, I, uh, I looked at all of the different scenarios that I talked about today. <laughs> so um, that's JIT, uh, J-A-O-T-C, uh, the native image from Grawl, our shared classes technology, which is JIT caching. Um, and um, also the JIT server technology that I talked about. Now, some of those technologies aren't available in all the same JDK. For example, JOTC is only available in JDK 11. So I did runs in 8 and 11. <laughs> um, and so I ended up generating quite a lot of data. And but what I'm going to try to do here is uh, flip to, is that going to work? No, of course not. Why would that work? <laughs> All right, I'm going to end this show. Uh. Can't find my cursor to end the show. Okay, this might be the reason why we can't see the data. Why can't I find my cursor? I should have tried this with a... Oh, oh, oh. Ta-da! Okay. All right. So, <laughs> I'm going to show you startup numbers, I'm going to show you footprint numbers, and I'm going to show you throughput numbers. They are all collected from the exact same run. So I ran all of these scenarios once, and I collected its startup time. It's f the footprint that was consumed at the end of the run, so after applying load. And uh, also, I'm going to show a throughput ramp-up graph, which I won't scare you with initially. <laughs> so 
Uh, each of these runs uh, represents a three minute load being applied to a server running Quarkus, running that REST plus CRUD application. And generally speaking, they all use the same command line options as a sort of base. They're all running with 128 megs of heap uh, as, the, as, their, um, as their heap configuration. And uh, in the hotspot case, they're all using G1 GC. In the J9 case, they're all using the default collector, which is a generational concurrent uh, collector. Uh, the only options that differ among them are the options that are needed to activate the different, um, the different compile, compilation options. Um, uh, with one exception. So, uh, I've split these two graphs into the JDK 8 side and the JDK 11 side. So, let me just start with the JDK 8 side. So, the one that you're all familiar with here is JDK 8 Hotspot, right? So, this is Hotspot's JIT, starting up in, I don't know, six plus seconds, almost seven seconds. Okay. Um, I can compare that to uh, J9, just as another JIT technology. It's a little bit slower by default. But if we turn on our shared class technology, then there's a market improvement that's happening in the startup. Now, Hotspot also runs on JDK 11 with almost the same performance, right, from here to here. So it went up, it went up, it got longer in JDK 11, but it's in the same ballpark. And if you use the AOT, that experimental JAOTC technology, you can see the performance, the startup performance gets down and, and virtually to the level of, of where the J9 shared cache technology is, right? So AOT is a very effective thing for improving startup performance. If you need to compile for tiered, that has a bit of an effect, right? You have to insert those hooks into the code, which means it runs a little bit slower, so you don't get quite the startup benefit, but it's not too bad. Um, if you are... Uh, what did I want to see? If you're using Grawl as a JIT, so I didn't really talk about this scenario, but there is a way that you can use the Grawl JIT compiler as an experimental tier four compiler in uh, OpenJDK as of JDK 10. Um, so that's what this line over here is. But Grawl is written in Java, which means it needs to be compiled itself. It needs to compile itself <laughs> in order to run faster, in order to compile code. And so it tends to have a slower startup than other compilers, which are you know, Hotspot and J9 are both written in C++. So they get the benefit of the static compilers that C++ has, uh, has, has developed. And, um, you know, there are ways to make this better, and I expect the community to, to do that. But this is kind of the current state of the world right now. Um, I'll point out the JIT server technology here. So uh, basically comparable, right? These are, this is J9, JIT server, no shared cache, uh, and with shared cache. And you can see they're they're basically the same. And the same thing is true in JDK 8, right? So there's a little bit of a benefit that you're getting in startup, but not very much, right? It's kind of the same thing. So you're not losing anything by using JIT server from a startup perspective. And then, you know, the, the bell of the ball here is uh, the, the native image uh, work from the, uh, with Substrate VM. The startup is very, very small. Uh, one thing I should have said before I started, all of these graphs have two, top, two, two bars. So all of the runs are done in Docker containers which, and all I did was call out here that it takes time to start a Docker container, right? Before you even get to the point of running Java, you spend a second, more than a second, starting the container, right? And so, um, once you get that container started, native image is very, very fast, right? Uh, but you still do need to get that Docker container started if you're using Docker containers. Uh, this would be even worse if you were running in Kubernetes, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> it takes even longer to start a Kubernetes pod up. Uh, to get running. These are all issues that somebody will work on and make better, but for the moment, that's kind of where we are. So, so that's kind of the startup picture. Um, now, hopefully I can move this over. No. Ah. Oh, that's why. There we go. All right. Don't want to scare you yet. All right. So this is the footprint graph. So exactly same options. Um, on the bottom here, right? This is again from the same runs. Sorry, I didn't take off the dash one off of all of these guys. Um, but it's this exact same runs. It's measured from the same run. And remember, this is footprint. This is RSS, resident set size, measured after the load, all of the load had been applied. So three minutes after the load had been applied. So this is well into steady state. This is kind of what you would expect the steady state footprint uh, results to be. And so we can do the same kind of, so we'll start with hotspot. So hotspots here a little over 200 megabytes, um, uh, and in JDK 11 got a little bit worse. If you're using this AOT, JAOTC, 
this was the most surprising result to me. I did not expect to see this uh, tremendous increase in resident set size when you're using the AOT code with, um, with uh, AOTC. I have no idea what is causing that. <laughs> so this may just be a problem with my runs, but um, the point I want to make here is that you can't just focus on this improvement and say, wow, AOT technology is great. You have to be watching for this too, because there's obviously a trade-off here, right? If you're trying to pack things densely onto a system, then your footprint growth is going to matter in terms of how much density you can achieve, even though you might start up faster. And then throughput is yet another story on top of that. All right, um, if we look at Grawl, Grawl is also using a little bit even more memory than Hotspot is using, not substantially more. This might just be noise. Um, if we look at uh, J9, so uh, J9 um, makes a big deal out of its memory efficiency. That's one of the advantages of the Open J9 uh, JVM. We've spent a lot of time over two decades trying to optimize uh, uh, J9's use of memory so that it's very efficient and it doesn't, it's frugal, it doesn't use memory if it doesn't need it to deliver throughput. And so in this particular application, that's, you know, roughly a quarter of the footprint is being reduced by, um, by J9 in the default case. If you use a shared class cache, there's a little bit of an extra bump that you need in order to store more things. Um, if you're using a JIT server, again, n almost no impact to footprint, right? So we've been very careful in designing this that when you use a JIT server, it doesn't end up consuming lots more memory on the client when you're uh, running at steady state. From a native image perspective, um, there are two options here which I haven't really talked about. Um, this is the first place where they kind of show. So I've got native and I've got native tuned. You'll see why I did this on the next slide. <laughs> but basically this, is, uh, this runs with a 128 meg heap and no other heap um, uh, parameters. This runs with 128 meg heap and uh, 110 meg nursery and uh, dash XMS of 100 meg. So it's, you have to help the GC in uh, the native image a little bit in order to get sort of to a tuned performance level. But that obviously has an impact on how much footprint it's going to use, right? You use larger heap, you told it to use a larger heap, so it's gonna use more memory. So that's not surprising. But the reason why I did that will become apparent when I hopefully <laughs> manage to scroll across. Okay, so everybody's sitting down, good. <laughs> Whoa. So welcome to my world. <laughs> All right, so this is, again, throughput measured with 40 clients for three minutes on each of these things running on one core. So let's see if I can get it all on the graph. Look at that. Virtually fits. Okay, so uh, y-axis here is requests per second. I took a measurement every second. So uh, this is basically the number of transactions that are being processed by the app every second. And then all of the same different variants that I talked about. Now, uh, <laughs> How do we cover this? So let's start at the bottom. This is native image, untuned. So out of the box, that's what I got, <laughs> um, which is pretty, I you know, can't see the y-axis here, so let me get that. So this is like under 500 compared to the top ones which are getting uh, more than 6,500, right? So 13 times less throughput uh, by default. <laughs> so. That's a pretty stark trade-off, but it turns out that that's just because the GC technology that's provided with the native image is kind of uh, rudimentary, I would say, at this point. And it's not able to adapt itself to figure out that, hey, I really should be growing the nursery size and I should be doing all, hey, all the things that all of the other JVMs do, you know, and have been trained to do for years and years. Uh, their GC doesn't do that yet. So that's why I had to do that tuning to add the large nursery and the large uh, small heap. And so this is the graph that, this is the tuned one, right? So you can see that it starts up really nice and fast, right? As we saw before, and then it even ramps up nice and fast because the code is there right away. Um, and it gets to, you know, kind of 3,500. If you go further out here, it does, uh, it kind of stays at this level, right? It's very consistent, right? Nothing's changing, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's not achieving the same level of throughput that the other options are able to achieve, right? So um, while it does produce extremely good startup and its footprint is not bad, its throughput is cut in half in this particular application, right? So these are the kinds of trade-offs that you end up being forced to look at when you start using different technologies to, to, to run your Java applications. Now, 
Um, let's see. Okay, so let's start moving up the up from the bottom. So this guy is Grawl. So this is using the Grawl JIT, and it's you know taking a long time to ramp up. It does, in fact, if you look at the very end, it's starting to get to the same levels as everybody else. But that ramp up is a consequence again of having to compile the compiler itself, and then you know the fact that they focus primarily on what the raw steady state you know after all the runs is. Um, they haven't spent as much time optimizing it through this ramp up period. Um, if we go up from there, this is where our AOT code is, the JAOT code with OpenJDK is. So it's better than Grawl, um, and it's a little bit, it's, it's fairly even here. It did, you know, sort of come up relatively quickly, but um, this is actually the tiered one. So the tiered one is able to start rejitting things using the JIT compiler, and it eventually starts climbing as well. I, I don't know whether this would actually hit or not. I didn't have time to do longer runs, <laughs> but I suspect it would. So, it, you know, because it is using C2 as the thing to rejit, so it should eventually hit the same level as C2. This one here, is, yeah, I'll wrap up very quickly. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, this is um, AOT without using tiered, so it stays very, relatively more consistent, but still, you know, fairly below where the top hitters are able to achieve, okay? Um, this is hotspot JDK 11. Something's going on with JDK 11 here. I'm not going to uh, talk about it, but it's one core, so hotspots really being pushed into a corner here. That's why it's not able to ramp up very quickly. If I ran this on four cores or eight cores, it would look very different. Where hotspot would be ramping up very quickly, but because it's only one core and it's got to share those resources with the with the the application that's trying to handle transactions, it's taking a long time. This is hotspot on JDK eight, so it does a little bit better. Um, the impacts of modularity and the other things that changed in JDK eleven are are less of an impact here. Um, and now we're kind of into the J9 points, right? So this is JDK, J9 on JDK 11. This is J9 on JDK 8, not using any cached JIT compiles. I'm going to switch to the other end here. This is actually J9 using caching JIT compiles and the JIT server, right? So this was the really good startup performance that we showed on the previous slide and the same footprint, and it's providing much faster ramp up, right? So this is... This is getting to peak performance after, you know, almost a half a minute compared to, you know, hotspot JDK 8 is out here at almost two, a little over two minutes, right? So it's ramping up much more quickly because it's able to offload that work to another server. Um, and then this is without, without the shared class cache. So the shared class cache is providing this boost in ramp up. Um, this is just using J9 with the shared cache. So the difference here is what the benefit of the share of the of the uh, JIT server is providing in terms of ramp up by offloading the work. Okay, uh, let's try to get back to my. Is that gonna work? Okay. I won't bother shifting into presentation mode. I'll wrap up quickly. So. Uh, the net result here is that the real thing that you should be using is the thing that you're already using. It's just JITs, <laughs> right? I'm not actually recommending that you change anything right now in terms of what you're using. Unless you happen to be in that one core scenario where you're trying to fit things into very tight scenarios. And then I think I'd recommend that you use OpenJ9. I think some of the data that I showed would at least cause you to consider that as an option, right? Um, again, that's one benchmark that I ran on one system and I work on OpenJ9, full disclosure, right? So everything with a grain of salt. You should really be measuring this stuff yourself. I tr I'm trying to show you how to, like how we look at performance when we're looking at improvements in the JVM. We're measuring all of these things at the same time so that when we improve things, we really know that we're improving as a whole in a balanced way. We're not artificially improving startup in, and taking a hit on throughput or forcing our users into a trade-off <laughs> where it's really hard to get you know, a good number in one area and, and uh, without hurting another area a lot. AOT compilers can improve startup by a lot, but there was that surprising footprint uh, boost to JA2C, which you don't see with native image, obviously. Um, uh, but the steady state performance was 2x on the order of 2x less than what a JIT can provide. So that's the kind of trade-off that you're looking at uh, unless you're using a caching JIT compiler, uh, which can get to almost the same level as the JIT can get to, uh, but also give you fast startup, fast ramp up, etc. 
um, even for really complicated. This isn't a super complicated app, but it's the most complicated Quarkus app I could find. <laughs> um, and finally, the JIT server stuff, which I showed in the data before, it really looks like a very attractive option. Um, uh, it is now released. It is available as a technology preview with Eclipse Open J9 0.18, which came out in the January update release. You can download it from Adopt Open JDK very easily. Um, and uh, give it a try and let us know what it looks like. This is what Adopt Open JDK's main site looks like. Just go to that right side and hit Open J9 and download it for Linux and, and give it a shot. It'll give you a JDK or a, or a JRE. I know I took a very long time talking. <laughs> There's a lot of information in there, but thank you for staying and listening. <laughs>